Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Um, my name is Alana Collicutt. I am the program manager for the Canadian Animal Task Force's Dog Care and Management Program. So the Canadian Animal Task Force um, provides resources and, and guidance to communities that are interested in developing humane and uh, comprehensive programs to manage their companion animals. Um, our goal is to improve public safety and the well-being of the animals. And this is my colleague, Josh. Josh, go ahead. Hello. Uh, I want to say uh, thank you for having me here. It's a great honor. Uh, uh, my name is Josh Littlechild. I'm the Director for the External Affairs in the Irmington Free Nation. Um, I've been working here for our government for the last five years, and uh, it's quite an honor to be here today. So thank you. And I just wanted to take a moment and mention that neither Josh or I is a lawyer. So if anyone in the audience gets an opportunity to work with First Nation bylaws in drafting or enforcing a First Nation bylaw, um, we always recommend that you should be receiving guidance from a lawyer. So right from the top, I'm just gonna bring everybody into kind of a, a big picture of where we're kind of at in this presentation. So um, comprehensive and humane dog population management has anywhere from six to eight tools generally, depending on um, what the community priorities are um, and concerns are. Mm -hmm. And we know that it's been shown that using more than one tool is, uh, creates a much more successful program. In this case, we are only talking about one tool of dog population management, and that is legislation. And in this presentation, we're focusing specifically on First Nation bylaws. This is our presentation agenda. Um, Josh is gonna start off by talking to us a little bit about First Nations inherent rights to govern. Um, that is a, a pretty, pretty heavy topic. And due to our time restriction, Josh is going to um, do his best to, to share some information about inherent rights. Uh, but like I said, it's a really big topic, so we're keeping things pretty general. Uh, the second thing we'll talk about a little bit is First Nation bylaws um, specifically, and then we'll finish the presentation with some great examples of sections out of dog bylaws, out of existing dog bylaws in First Nations that we're really excited about and feel are really progressive for animal welfare. Well, thanks uh, for that intro. Um, I can specifically speak Treaty 6, uh, the area that I work in and I live in. Um, so Treaty 6, uh, the British and, and First Nations agreement that was made out here, had a lot of concessions and, and certain um, provisions in the, in the treaty. And one of the treaty, uh, so a lot of things were ceded and surrendered, but one thing that was really clear that the right to self-govern uh, Indigenous peoples it wasn't surrendered so um, a lot of uh, our governance comes from that an inherent right to self there's a, there's a right to govern your own people and there's a right to develop and manage uh, your own affairs the way you see fit um, so that, that that's a broad overview high level overview of, of what that what, when you hear that term that's that's what they most likely would be referred to Okay, so a brief history of treaty. We uh, signed our treaty in 1877, Fort Carlton and Fort Pitt. Uh, my dad was an adhesion uh, signatory of the treaty, uh, and, and uh, that's, that's how we kind of got here into this situation that we're in today. <laughs> okay, so uh, concerning dog, uh, like bylaws, uh, First Nations can use uh, a piece of legislation put forward uh, through, by Canada, I guess, today, but 
it was most likely done by the British. It was done by the British um, for bylaws that, that will help govern the First Nations. So uh, if a First Nation doesn't want to use their inherent right to govern, they can also use Section 81 of the Indian Act, which uh, commonly will allow First Nations to press through and produce their own bylaws uh, with it, within, in accordance with the, the Section 81 that, that kind of sets out all the bylaws that the First Nations are allowed to set out uh, in within that act. Um, so once it's done, it's usually published uh, either online or commonly on the First Nations uh, Gazette website. Um, it, it's a bit controversial and provocative as it might look like First Nations are diminishing their right to govern, where some First Nations want to govern this way. So it, it really is a, a unique, uh, it, it's an opportunity to govern uh, in whatever manner that a First Nation feels it's best for them. So the difference between an Indian Act ban and a custom ban is, uh, well, some bans, uh, uh, choose to use the Indian Act to do a lot of their governing, uh, which is impose legislation from from the government of Canada, and a custom ban chooses to govern and regulate the ban through an inherent right that's granted through treaty um, that we use to govern our people by our by our treaty right, not through legislation. So one's more of a policy, and one more one is more of a of a right that's we've been practicing for, you know, since time memorial. Uh, it's a little complex, but we're just doing a high level overview today. Um, and I think, uh, I think that's about as deep as I could go for our time right now. So, um, one thing that often comes up, um, if you are an animal, rescue working or partnering with a First Nation community um, or perhaps you're uh, an SPCA officer, you've probably heard a lot of talk about what laws apply in a First Nation community. Um, this is up for great legal debate. Uh, it is the precedence of legislation, whether it's provincial or federal, whether it's banned council bylaws, that the precedence, the hierarchy is always changing because it's being tested in court all the time. So just generally speaking, um, it's, it can look like the Canadian constitution, then federal laws like the criminal code, um, then the Indian Act or a banned constitution, if they're a custom banned. Uh, banned council bylaws fits in right under that, and then other federal laws. Um, provincial laws may coexist in this hierarchy somewhere um, unless they interfere with treaty or Aboriginal rights. So if this sounds confusing, it's because it definitely is, and it's changing constantly. So we just wanted to put this in here and just say, generally speaking, um, that this hierarchy is tested constantly. Yeah, and it's not, it can, the order can change uh, depending on which band uh, you're talking to. Totally. It's not like a one, yeah, it's not like a one size fits all. Totally. Okay, so, um, We'll just start with the definition of a First Nation bylaw. Uh, so a First Nation bylaw is a local law. It's passed by a band council and it's used to help control certain activities within a community. Uh, bylaw is strictly a local law and is not applicable outside of the reserve. Bylaws apply to all people on reserve, whether you are a resident or a visitor. Um, these last few slides, uh, Josh and I are going to be referring to a couple of existing First Nation dog bylaws that are really progressive. And those are the Ermanskin Cree Nation, 
um, dog bylaw, which is where Josh is from, as well as we'll be quoting Siksika First Nation uh, dog bylaw, which um, was actually the Canadian Animal Task Force's um, pilot project um, for a comprehensive dog program. So um, we assisted with the development of the Siksika Nation bylaws, so I know them well. And we also have um, the Canadian Animal Task Force worked with a lawyer to create a dog bylaw template that we can share with First Nations that kind of gives um, a community um, a starting point with a dog bylaw. Um, and uh, we share them with communities that are interested in developing their own law. So we'll be quoting from those three different places. So just to start off, so you, you kind of understand um, the, the breadth of what we're talking about is there are over 600 First Nations in Canada, um, over 1.7 million people identify as First Nations. Um, the majority of First Nations allow for free roaming dogs. And sometimes this can create public safety and animal welfare risks. Um, most communities, most First Nation bands use um, the First Nation Gazette as a place to publish their bylaws. So I went through the First Nation Gazette website and I counted the number of bylaws that currently have been enacted and are existing. And there are 180 dog bylaws um, in Canada. They are on average 18 years old. And when speaking with colleagues like Josh or um, colleagues um, in dog population management across Canada, we have only hypothesized that there are probably less than 5% of these dog bylaws are actually enforced or consistently enforced. So there is something really unique that we're seeing in um, First Nation dog bylaws, and that is that these dog bylaws often address both animal welfare as well as animal control. So this is really unique because um, we might see in our own municipality that there is uh, a dog bylaw, but it only covers animal control. And we rely on the Provincial Animal Protection Act in Alberta, at least, um, to manage animal welfare. So, but in First Nations, we're seeing a trend where these dog bylaws actually cover both animal welfare and animal control which is like in Urban Skin Cree Nation, right, Josh? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Josh is gonna talk a little bit about another unique um, attribute to a First Nation law, First Nation bylaw. Yeah, so what makes uh, a First Nation bylaw a First Nation bylaw? Well, uh, in my experience uh, in helping develop laws with uh, our nation, I think what differentiates or is so divisive between uh, um, a Indian Act law or a corporate law and uh, in a custom law is, I think the custom, the, well, what breathes life into a law, and I'm so grateful that I had a great colleague to teach me this, is that uh, the the people make the law. Laws reflect society and and societal values and societal practices and norms. And so when the people get together to write preamble, uh, the people will talk about why they're doing it, and what, what they believe and what the law is actually doing to help further and uphold what they believe. So in Ermiston, uh, our preamble for our dog law reads, as you can see on the screen, I'll just read to you, where the Ermiston Cree Nation has a deep and abiding respect of the creator's natural laws and the great sense of stewardship with long-standing traditional and spiritual relationship with domestic animals, in particular dogs, at the moi, um, and holds such uh, animals in high regard and as such strives to ensure that the matters uh, related to such animals are cared
carried out in a conscientious, respectful, and calm manner. Um, that, divide, that, that comes from a long, long stories, creation stories. A lot of our, uh, a lot of our traditional stories about um, uh, how we live with animals, and, and those, those stories, and really reflect our practices. Um, and those, those practices come from our, our stories that kind of create the laws and how we behave. So uh, on a high level overview, again, it's kind of what the, the preamble of our law uh, provides uh, in, our, in our way of government. So um, one of the things about First Nation dog bylaws that's really, really important is that they have to be culturally relevant. So um, what that means at the very beginning of the development stage of a bylaw is that often the community, the first thing they're going to have to decide is, are they going to allow for free roaming dogs or are they going to um, create a law that mean that says that dogs are not allowed to be at large. Um, this is really important kind of to decide at the beginning because it obviously, um, this decision is going to significantly change the way the law is written. So, I've definitely um, spoken with some communities that feel that they want to continue uh, managing their dogs as free roaming, that they just want to manage dogs that are quote unquote a nuisance or that are um, aggressive, acting aggressively or, or being considered a dangerous dog. So they want free roaming dogs, but they, they only want to manage nuisance behavior and aggressive behavior. Whereas other communities uh, may not want to have free roaming dogs anymore. Per perhaps they've had a really, really serious incident between a dog and a child. And they really, for public safety reasons, feel that they do not want dogs to be um, at large at all anymore. And of course, that comes with consequences as well too, because if the community, let's say, um, it's not common in that community for an individual home to have fencing around it, what that means is that dog owners will really have no choice but to tether their dog. They'll have to tie up their dog. And as we all know, that can cause, um, you know, some pretty significant welfare issues, as well as it can increase um, safety risks especially when it comes to elders and children. So. Josh, this is one of the definitions in um, your ermine skin dog law. And um, we kind of put it in this presentation because I feel that it goes kind of a step further to ensure that that welfare and the well-being of the dog is being looked after. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it, we, uh, we've seen all sorts of uh, muzzling devices uh, on our nation and um, we're really grateful that uh, Alana uh, and, and our legal counsel, you know, pulled together such a good definition that, um, that's actually practical and it, 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 it is effective and very defin definitive of what we want to see our nation's citizens uh, uh, practice. Um, and so, you know, the, the dog uh, being allowed to drink, I think uh, is, is huge, uh, if you're gonna do it. And I mean, uh, you know, we don't want people zip tying or taping, heaven forbid that, uh, which we come across. Um, I think this uh, this level of uh, the specific definition that's, that's very clear on what we want is a very high standard that we're asking our people to, to follow. And I know not a lot of laws out there are 
or maybe they are. Uh, I could be wrong that, that defined muzzles as, as, as clearly as we've done here. So thank you. I think this is a great definition. Yeah. And in this example, um, I'm quoting um, a definition that we have in our Canadian Animal Task Force template that we share with communities. Um, so this is a definition of threatening behavior. But what's unique about this definition is that it considers that a dog may be considered provoked in circumstances where the dog is in its usual environment and a person fails to acknowledge the dog's clear warning signs, including body language, that the dog is feeling threatened or defensive and is likely to bite. So um, this particular definition was created uh, specifically for dogs in free roaming environments. And um, what it actually does is it puts some responsibility back on the human, on the human to say um, it is our responsibility as humans to recognize an animal that is very uncomfortable and to stop continuing to do what is making the animal uncomfortable. Um, and so I feel that this is a really progressive definition of threatening behavior because it includes that extra section on provocation and probability, really, that you will be bitten. So of course, this, this definition really brings up the idea that it's important for um, community members to have access to information that will help them to start identifying dog body language and um, particular behaviors that might be threatening. Oh, licensing. Josh and I love licensing, right, Josh? <laughs> it's pretty fun when it works. <laughs> yeah. So, licensing is a section that um, we've spoken to many uh, communities about in the past. Um, licensing and registration is a very challenging thing to do in a community where the dogs are free roaming. And that is because dogs that are free roaming tend to lose their collars and their license tags fairly quickly. Um, either the dogs take them off of each other or they get them caught on things or people take collars off and put them on a different dog. And, and so um, that can make it challenging as well. One dog may have different primary owners throughout its life. So, um, these things make it really having a licensing and registration program for a free roaming dog community. Um, it becomes a very heavy administrative task to manage a program like this, a licensing and registration program like this. That all being said, licensing is also a really um, useful initiative for gathering demographics which are really, really important. And it also helps to encourage owners to be responsible for managing their dog's um, care and behavior in the community. So um, when communities would like to move forward with licensing and registration and include it in their bylaw, we will often recommend that the first year of licensing is free. And we do that just so we can really get community members um, to be interested and to buy in on registering their pet. Um, and also, like in Josh's community, they use um, the licensing program as um, a, if, if you sign up, then, then you will have access to uh, the pet food bank should you need it. Um, and we also recommend that the licensing is free for the life, well, no, sorry, not free, but that a license is valid for the life of the dog. Yeah. And dangerous dogs. So I obviously, I put, I put a quote around dangerous because I feel that um, not all dogs that bite are dangerous dogs. 
but it is um, really common language to use in a bylaw to have a section that relates to dangerous dogs. Um, in this slide, uh, this is this um, section is taken directly out of the Siksika Nation dog bylaw, and um, it is fairly similar to the Ermine Skin Cree Nation law as well. So, just in general, um, what this section says is that if a dog can be positively identified after an investigation, that the dog who is bitten can be impounded for a 10-day rabies hold. During that 10-day rabies hold, um, the dog is given a behavior assessment by a professional, and then the animal control officer, or animal welfare officer, will take the information from the investigation and the behavior assessment report, and they are tasked with making the decision about whether a dog will be released back to the owner and into the community, or rehabilitated and rehomed, which is usually done through a animal rescue, or humanely euthanized. And one thing to mention is that um, in Siksika, the ACO also has one additional piece of authority uh, when it comes to the dangerous dog section, and that is if the dog is, if the animal control officer decides to release the dog back to the owner, the officer also has the authority to say that the dog will need to be fixed at the owner's expense prior to returning the dog. So um, this uh, system is what's used in Siksika. It seems to be working fairly well. Um, and I feel it, it gives um, the community um, and the, the dog some time to cool down and decide how to move forward. What are your thoughts on this, Josh? Has it worked well in your community? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm really proud of our ACOs and I'm really proud of our work that we've done with our stakeholders in, in assisting these dogs in a very humane and welfare-centered uh, method. Totally. Um, in my experience, we, especially living here and working here, we, and anything we know, we've come a long way. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm really proud of our nation and Siksika. I'm really proud of Siksika too for yeah. really taking uh, first steps to lead the way uh, as Siksika has um, and to, to, you know, set an example for a lot of nations to, to treat their animals in such a humane fashion. And it's working well for us. I mean, yeah. we've had many dogs pulled off that that have uh, under this the, the definition of this law, uh, dangerous dog. Uh, it, it, it's helped us pull the the dog behavior and remedy the dog's behavior. Now, that was one thing that that really opened my, my mind is, is how behavior centered uh, this action is, is really focused on. It doesn't yeah. really have to, anything to do with the breed or or uh, you know where this dog lives, it's usually just the behavior. And in my experience, uh, behavior is something that can be treated. And uh, I've I've seen the professionals that we work with uh, handle these dogs very well. Yeah, and I think that just because an officer decides that a dog is not going to be returned to the community, it doesn't mean that they're making that decision because they feel the dog is really dangerous. In a lot of cases, the officers are deciding not to return the dog because the dog is just not set up for success in a free roaming environment. Um, that the dog can have a more successful life in a different environment, which might be um, in somebody's home under their direct supervision, as opposed to being unsupervised in a free roaming environment. So. It's, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really proud of this as well. So, uh, female dogs in season. That's something that's mentioned in uh, the Siksika Nation bylaw. Um, and we think it's pretty fantastic because anybody that works with the dog population in a First Nation community where the dogs are free roaming uh, recognizes that a dog that's in heat 
is a recipe for disaster in a free roaming environment. Um, so in the Six Sikas bylaws, it says the owner of a female dog that's in season shall keep the, door, the dog either indoors or in a secure enclosure. And um, we love that. It gives the officer the opportunity to pick up a dog um, that is clearly in heat and um, causing public safety issues for both community members as well as dogs in the area. And so the officer can pick up the dog, impound the dog into a safe environment while it's in heat. And then the owner can claim the dog, but the owner will have to pay for um, the boarding fees and any care fees associated with the impounding of the dog. Okay, so five freedoms, Josh. Oh yeah. So Section 26. <laughs> One of our favorite uh, sections of the urban skin bylaw. Yeah, I think this was a big shaker for a lot of people when this came in, um, but it, it makes sense. Uh, and I want to thank the, the legal team, the, the people of Birmingham for ratifying this law and the consultants that put this uh, section together for our law. Cause it's, it's very uh, practical. Uh, one of those things that people shouldn't have to say, but those things that need to be written down so everybody knows kind of thing. And I'm really grateful that our nation took uh, um, a step forward in, in, in putting this piece of uh, this, this section in our, in our legislation. And it says, um, giving basic cares to the dog, uh, section 26A, uh, the, owner, uh, that the owner must ensure that the uh, dog receives food, water, shelter, and proper veterinary care and exercise sufficient to maintain the dog in good health and uh, that the, the area of the owner's property where the dog is kept at all times be maintained in a clean, sanitary, and unoffensive condition. And uh, we've had to exercise this law a few times, but speaking about exercise, I'm really proud that I, I have seen uh, a few of our nation members running and exercising their dogs on leash. You know, compared to five, six years ago, that's, that's a big step. It totally is, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And um, our Canadian Animal Task Force template takes it just a step further. Um, and this is because what we're suggesting here is um, for greater clarification with respect to the shelter requirement, that the owner of a single coated dog must ensure the dog is kept primarily indoors during the winter months. And this is because, and I think there'll be some people um, watching this presentation that will agree here that we are seeing an increase in the ownership of bully breed dogs in First Nation communities and um, a large part of Canada the climate is not appropriate for a bully breed dog with a single coat to be living outdoors. So this is why our template has this additional piece and actually, I'm really excited to say that this um, language will be used in a First Nation community bylaw um, in Southern Alberta uh, fairly soon. It's not enacted yet, but uh, fingers crossed it will be soon. Anti-tethering, so uh, ermine skin, yeah. Yeah, ermine skin, so. You want me to speak to this, Alana? Uh, sure, we can the, share it. Uh, the owner must not leave a dog tethered in an unsupervised uh, on the own, owner's property or in public property. 2603, a uh, tethered dog must A, have unrestricted movement within the range of a tether used to tie up the dog. Uh, B, not able to injure itself as a result of the tethering. C, be tethered in such a manner that it's so uh, that it does not the tether does not permit the dog to go beyond the limits of the owner's property. The not to not be tethered continuously and the the tether to uh, be tethered to a tether that is appropriate in length for the size of the dog, provided that the owner shall under no circumstances tie up a dog where a metal collar forms part of the tether. That's a lot of tether regulations. 
It is. Basically, what it says is don't use chain. Make sure it's long enough. No metal stuff around his neck. You can't leave the dog uh, unattended while it's tethered. Uh, it needs to be supervised at all times. And yeah. your dog will injure, injure itself, right? Absolutely. I think it really covers a lot of the concerns um, that somebody has when it comes to animal welfare and tethering. So mm -hmm. I think it's great. Um, so just so Josh, you know, we have about five minutes left. Oh, okay. Well, not, this not section, long. okay. This section uh, is talking about dangerous dogs. If a dog is deemed dangerous, you're only allowed to have one. Uh, there's a lot of provisions behind that. Uh, you can check it out online. Uh, it's First Nations to Death, from the Indian Nation, uh, dog law, uh, prohibited animal. Prohibited animal and dog bylaw, I yeah. think. Yeah, dog bylaw, yeah. And uh, and only one intact dog on on any premises within the reserve. So you're only allowed to have three, and only one one can be intact. <laughs> Yes, only one dangerous dog and only one intact dog on a premise. And um, now, Josh, you were going to, uh, your community, your leadership was thinking about amending your law, possibly. Yeah, yeah right? we are looking at, uh, we're looking at uh, protecting bully breeds on our nation, as Atlanta um, said before, it's, they're a growing uh, popular breed out here, and as a, as a way to protect them, we uh, would like to see a limited number of breeds at a home, and as well as uh, there's going to be a breeding of such breeds that uh, we license uh, and authorize the breed. Yeah, so I think you're looking at uh, possibly making it a requirement that bully breed dogs must be fixed in the nation, yeah. right? And yeah. that's that's not because your leadership feels bully breeds are dangerous. It's because your nation feels that they're not appropriate to be living outdoors. So t in order to protect their welfare, um, they want to reduce the breeding, right? And then, oh, absolutely. and then also you are considering putting in a fairly hefty license fee for breeders as well. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Okay, so um, in Ermine Skin's law, there is a section about authority of other agencies, and this might relate a little bit to the hierarchy we showed you at the beginning. Um, there being some question about if Ermine Skin has a dog bylaw that addresses animal welfare, then does the Alberta Animal Protection Act actually have jurisdiction on the reserve? Um, this takes away any confusion. It basically says, if an animal protection officer from um, the Alberta SPCA wants to come into the community, they just need to contact the animal control officer in Ermanskin and together um, animal control in Ermanskin, so the dog program as well as the ASPCA will work together on any reported calls that the ASPCA gets. And um, Ermanskin may even ask uh, the ASPCA for assistance if there's a really large um, case that they're working on. That pretty much covers it, I think. Hey, Josh? Yeah? Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm going to sit up in my talk. <laughs> Siksika Nation, another unique thing about um, some First Nation bylaws is they have put in traditional mediation as an option when appealing or um, contesting a decision that's been made using the dog bylaw. So Escapima Geeks is a um, mediation program that's run by elders in Siksika Nation. So there's an option to appeal um, a decision through that di dispute resolution mechanism, which is Escapima Geeks. Um, and uh, that's very unique to Siksika Nation. And um, this is the Canadian Animal Task Forces, uh, a section at the end of the template that we have. And um, this is 
about restricting ownership of dogs um, for an indetermined amount of time. So if an owner has committed a substantial breach of the bylaw, which causes emergency veterinary care for their dog, um, or a licensed veterinarian um, opines that the dog has been subjected to serious neglect or abuse of both, the ACO does have the authority um, to refuse to return the dog to the owner and, we're, and also uh, may prohibit the owner from taking future ownership of dogs by refusing to issue that person a dog license, either until certain conditions are met or, the, the, or indefinitely. So this is also a section that we hope to see in a brand new bylaw in Southern Alberta coming soon. And uh, this uh, is a quote from your Uncle Willie, Josh. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Uncle Willie, uh, while he was the Confederate uh, Treaty 6 chief, uh, told me, if you're going to create laws, on First Nations, you must be willing to do well. There must be, there's two criteria. You must be insured, you've got to ensure that the laws are ethical, and uh, you got to be willing to defend the law. And the more and more ponder that, that, that Zen, that Zen uh, Williism, <laughs> but uh, yeah, you, you got to ensure that they're ethical, and you got to make sure that they're uh, you're willing to defend them. So this is the end of our presentation. Um, thank you so, so much for having us. It's been an honor. And um, certainly feel free to get in touch with either Josh or I if you have any questions or comments or, or anything like that. Uh, Josh and I both really love talking about this stuff. <laughs> so thank you. And Josh? Yeah, thank you, Nina Sonoman. Uh, hi, hi. Thanks for listening to us, and please feel free to reach out to us if anything interests you. And I really appreciate your time here, and Alana, thank you too, and thank you for the organizers. Uh, for your <laughs> awesome. Okay, well, thanks, guys. Take care.